Mr. Lodge, look, uh, look ahead a bit, if you would. Uh, how do you see the situation in South Vietnam developing? Well, I think it's going to uh, improve as time goes on. I believe the measures that uh, we're taking against uh, North Vietnam are going to make them uh, realize that uh, this adventure of theirs is unprofitable. Then I think uh, we are, we and the South Vietnamese are learning more and more about how to cope with terrorism in the South. I've just seen uh, some figures showing that in the last two and a half months, 322 hamlets have been pacified in the area immediately surrounding Saigon, which is 800,000 people, and that the people are turning over information about the Viet Cong to the government. Now, if you can do that all over the country, you will have won the struggle in South Vietnam. Because uh, like everything else to do with Vietnam, there isn't any one thing that's going to bring you victory. You have to put pressure on the North. You have at the same time to convince the North that you can win in the South. Do we have any idea why this has happened in the area around Saigon? Well, I think we're learning how to cope with terrorism. Uh, to cope with terrorism, you have to organize the totality of the population. Because the terrorist comes into a town, and the first thing he does is kidnap the mayor, cut off his head, and walk it around on a pole, and then disembowel the chief of police and leave, him, leave his body there on the main street so as to paralyze the law enforcement and the security forces of the community. And in order to cope with that, the community has to organize to give security to the authorities. And that is a kind of a struggle we've never had. Um, Mao Zedong, the communist leader of, uh, of China, said that war is politics uh, with bloodshed, and politics is war without bloodshed, and that these are the two wings of statecraft. Now, we've never had to fight that kind of a war. We think of wars as being military wars, like World War II and Korea. Well, in this thing, the military phase isn't the only phase, and there are times when it isn't even the most decisive phase. How long, Mr. Lodge, do you think an American military presence will be necessary in South Vietnam? Well, I don't think, uh, you never hear the communists talking about when they're going to get out. Never. You, you, I challenge you, distinguished journalist that you are, uh, to find me a clipping in the New York Times in which it says, quote the communists are saying, we're going to get out by Friday, we're going to get out by October. They never talk about it. We ought not to talk about getting out. Um, the world is going to be dangerous and disorderly and complicated for the rest of our natural lives and everybody's life now living. What do you think of the prospect of negotiations that might, uh, some people believe, preclude our remaining or make unnecessary our remaining there for so long? Well, of course, the minute uh, the, uh, the, the North Vietnamese cease their aggression, we can come right home. The minute they cease it. Uh, and I think they will cease it when uh, it's become clear that it's extremely unprofitable to them to continue it. You have an educated guess about... Uh how much farther the uh, raids would have to go and how much deeper into North Vietnam to bring about the uh, change of heart that you foresee? No, you're always asking me when, when, when. I don't know when. I, I know things that you ought to do that have a good chance of working sometime, but I can't tell you when. <laughs> you think the raids are effective? Oh, yes, I'm sure they are. And, of course, uh, if there's a carrot and a stick angle to it, they must be aware that much, uh, many good things could come to them if they were to start behaving themselves well, properly. What could come to them? What, what well, I mean, there's the whole uh, rice surplus in South Vietnam. In South Vietnam. Yeah. Even now, with a war on and with uh, shooting going on and, and not up-to-date methods of cultivation, they still produce a surplus of rice. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, and they're having great trouble feeding the people in North Vietnam. There, there is an impression, perhaps, that our European allies find the French argument more persuasive than they find ours, but they, they are oh, inclined, no. you don't think they oh, accept no. the French oh, idea that we cannot make it? Not at all. When, when I was there, there was no question that they were grateful that we, the United States, was carrying this load, and there would be absolute consternation in Europe if we were to announce that we were going to withdraw. The absolute consternation. It would call into question the value of our would as regards Atlantic as regards Atlantic matters. They'd say, well, my heavens, if the Americans can't undertake this commitment on which they've freely entered, uh, how do we know we can trust them to keep their word in Europe? What's happened to the argument that the war has to be won in the South by the South Vietnamese people themselves? Well, I, I, I touched on that. The, we have got to learn how to overcome 
communist subversion terrorism, not only in Vietnam, but everywhere where there are underdeveloped countries. This is the greatest single external threat that the United States confronts, greater than the nuclear, because we have an advantage in the nuclear and also well understood methods of procedure. But this subversion terrorism, we have not yet learned how to cope with it. And until we do, you will not be able, in my opinion, to convince Hanoi or the communists that they cannot win. So while the pressure that is put on directly is, is, is to the good, because it clarifies our aims, makes it clear we're in earnest and we intend to stay with it, uh, we, we must develop a technique for coping with terrorism. And that's why I read those figures uh, from the so-called hop tack area just around Saigon, because that is the kind of thing which, if we learn how to do it throughout the whole country, will overcome communist division and terrorism. Mr. Lodge, the affairs of the South Vietnamese government sometimes seem to have almost a comic opera quality. And that, I think, does not inspire a great deal of confidence among the American people that the South Vietnamese government can actually do the necessary job. Can anything be done about that? The, um, they have no tradition of national government such as we have. And uh, as in most underdeveloped countries, the capital is, is very cut off uh, from the rest of the surrounding country. Uh, they never had a national government until 1954, and they have no tradition for doing it. The thing that they have that has vitality are the local, regional, tribal, religious groupings. Uh, you've got two million people that belong to a religious sect called the Hua Ho's. You've got three million people that belong to another one called the Cao Dai's. Now, those are things that mean a lot to the people. These are tropical people, which means that nature is very rich and you don't have to go far away to get what you need in order to live. Uh, these are Confucianist people who believe in, in venerating their, their forefathers and ancestor worship. And therefore, their loyalty is to groups uh, consisting of people with whom they're related. Um, so you haven't, you've never had nationalism in the way that we know it. Um, Many of them don't consider themselves, uh, they don't understand what the flag and the republic and all those things mean. And yet they're very brave. Uh, I must have talked with 50 of our young uh, West Point captains who were advising the battalions, and they always speak highly of the bravery of the Vietnamese soldier, but he isn't moved by the same things that, uh, that, that move us. So the uh, national government is not one of the things they do best. And we shouldn't judge them as though we were judging ourselves, because they're not, they're not doing the same thing. How essential is uh, an effective national government in South Vietnam? It is essential if they're not going to be gobbled up by communist China. And that's what uh, some of the Vietnamese understand very well. And that's why they have decided to form a national government. And with our help, we are trying to help them become a modern nation state. Uh, but if it were not for communist China being a neighbor, uh, they could get along very well with this sort of a loose, localized, fragmented organization that they have. They have a sense of, of peoplehood without having a sense of nationhood. Uh, they have a language, a distinct race, distinct literature, art, uh, all that. Um, but they haven't got a sense of nationhood. Government affairs in South Vietnam sometimes have a comic opera quality with one set of generals replacing another and another set replacing that set. And that doesn't give the American people, I think, much confidence that the South Vietnamese government can do the job that has to be done. Is there anything that can be done about that? I don't think victory depends on having a strong national government. Also, I don't think you're going to have a strong national government for a long time. I think uh, these changes that are taking place are evolutionary. I think they are the advance of a people towards becoming a modern nation state. But when you have one set of generals throwing out another set of generals, throwing out another set of generals, and it seems to go on ad infinitum, mm -hmm. is that weakening? It's, it's be much, oh yes, it's, it's, it is the problem. If you had governmental stability, the, you couldn't have a Viet Cong, the thing would be over. This is the problem. It isn't a question of getting a stable government and then going on and winning a war for three years. If you got a really stable society in the country, you wouldn't have any war because this is a political war. In other words, you're saying the stable government would come out of the stable society. Oh, absolutely.
but we cannot have a stable Absolutely. government and then a stable society. It can't work that way. I think, uh, um, I think it's very hard for a government to become a, um, a very successful going concern if it hasn't got the roots out among the people. Uh, and they haven't got national political machines or organizations the way we have. I think this thing can work out. If we persist, if we don't get easily discouraged, uh, if we keep the external pressures uh, down, which I think we're doing, if we learn how to overcome this communist subversive terroristic technique, uh, and I think we can do all these things if we persist. And it's not in the American tradition to get, uh, to get panicky just because there's a little rough weather. And, and if we're going to just interest ourselves in the nice, quiet, neat countries, that don't need our help and turn over all the rough, tough countries to the communists, there isn't going to be much left. Won't be much left of us either.